Thank you, Asha, Professor Maoz, for the invitation. I'm honored to uh, introduce uh, Cole Durham, who is a professor and the founding director of the International Center of Law and Religion Studies at Brigham Young University. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, uh, where he was a note editor at the Harvard Law Review and uh, managing editor of the Harvard International Law Journal. And his uh, recording uh, session is uh, on dignity, freedom of religion, and the role of mutual understanding in stabilizing peace. Uh, and you can just turn it on. Thank you. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for their initiative and work in planning to bring about this conference. I owe special thanks to Ganun Diop of the International Religious Liberty Association and Asher Maoz at the Perez Academy for friendship and collaboration over many years, and I welcome their initiative to organize this conference to be held in Israel, the cradle of Abrahamic religions, and a deeply fitting setting for a conference on religion, social solidarity, and global peace, building a better future. The aim of my paper is to focus on the deep structure, the underlying social and political architecture that is at the core of successful linkage of broad focuses of this, conferences, of this conference, religion, social solidarity, global peace, and building a better future. My argument in brief is that the ideal of human dignity as reflected in effective protection of freedom of religion or belief is critical to stabilizing just social orders and as such is critical to just peace at all levels, global, national, local, family, and individual relations. For those in this audience, this is a familiar axiom of modern pluralist societies, but we need to remember that it is an argument that is paradoxical in key respects. It entails maintaining respect for the beliefs of others that can be deeply different from one own, one's own beliefs. For this reason, the canons of freedom of religion or belief often seem counterintuitive at the level of ordinary politics. This has made sound implementation of the principles I will discuss difficult throughout human history. The starting point for excavating the minimum conditions for social peace is a revolutionary insight associated with the thought of John Locke where much of prior political theory had assumed that social stability presupposed religious homogeneity, Locke recognized that it is not so much religious differences that causes conflict, but pressures to coerce religious homogeneity. Stated differently, Locke recognized that the real source of violence perpetrated in the name of religion is not religious difference itself, a defensive conduct when conscientious convictions are threatened by efforts to coerce social monism. This fundamental Lockean insight was revolutionary when first pronounced and when first introduced as a principle of social order in American constitutionalism. In the nearly two and a half centuries that have elapsed since this principle was embodied in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, the world has had extensive experience in attempting to implement this basic principle. At this point, there are several things we have learned about this pluralist insight. First, we are much less naive about thinking about religion per se as a cause of conflict. The secularist historical account of the emergence of religious freedom, according to which the Westphalian achievement of religious peace was accomplished by relegating religion to the private sphere, has been subject to rigorous academic challenge. Close analysis of conflicts that involve religious actors often demonstrate that it is not religion itself that causes conflicts, but a variety of other factors. Second, we now have much better empirical evidence that religious freedom is strongly correlated with and likely to be causally contributory to achievement of countless other social goods. Third, we have, more, we have a more refined view of the limits of Lockean theory. We recognize with Locke that freedom of religion or belief is not boundless. But experience in intervening years has shown us that a more robust version of pluralism is workable than what he originally proposed. He thought that public good aimed at by law would seldom clash with individual con conscience. And when it did, the conscientious objector should suffer the consequences of his beliefs. In his view, 
The private judgment of a person, quote, does not take away the obligation of that law in order to serve a dispensation, unquote. The issue of whether neutral and general laws should override claims of conscience has been, of course, one of the central dramas of modern constitutional theory. While debate continues, legal regimes sensitive to the problem have recognized that both the intrinsic justice and the stability strengthening potential of religious freedom are enhanced if the law is construed to avoid conscious, conscientious conflict, except where there is a compelling need to override conscience that cannot be achieved in some less restrictive way. Fourth, uh, we are conscious that at some point, Locke was right that tolerance does not need to extend to the intolerant. But we now understand that this Lockean concern can function successfully in societies with a far broader range of pluralization. Where Locke applied his principle in ways that excluded Catholics, Muslims, atheists, and perhaps Jews, we understand that stable societies can be far more pluralistic. Experience with Hitler's Germany and other societies has provided stark reminders that democratic societies need to be able to defend themselves against groups that threaten democratic institutions themselves. Uh, but there is substantial room in stable societies for people with deeply different worldviews. Fifth, we need to refine uh, we need a refined version of Locke's sense of the important separation of temporal and spiritual orders. Locke, quote, esteemed above all things necessary to distinguish exactly the business of civil government from that of religion and to settle the just bounds that lie between the one and the other, unquote. Drawing this line, however, cannot be done sensitively by merely relegating religion to the private sphere and prescribing religious incursions into public life. That approach merely substitutes secular dogmatism for religious dogmatism without affording appropriate protections for all. What is critical is an inclusive and flexible form of secularity that confirms no distinctive coercive power on either religious or secular worldviews, but rather affords inclusive recognition of the dignity of all. The minimum conditions necessary for a stable peace can thus be much more narrowly defined than was first intimated by Locke's insight. What is critical is not cultural homogeneity, but a much narrower pluralistic commitment that can be articulated as follows. What counts is not whether religious people appreciate other beliefs and practices, or whether they admit of alternative paths to salvation. What really matters is whether each, on sound internal grounds, supports the public doctrine of the equal inherent dignity and inalienable freedom, inalienable freedom of all human beings, irrespective of their religion, life stance, or any other differences, and that each reasonably understands or else trusts that others similarly support general freedom of religion or belief. Note that in the end, what is really required for social peace at the core of the Lockean insight as adapted and refined over ensuing centuries, is a shared commitment to an idea of human dignity. This idea needs to be sufficiently robust that it can give rise to reciprocal bases of trust that human dignity, as variously understood by those holding different worldviews and life stances, will be protected. Significantly, it was reliance on this type of concept of human dignity that paved the way for the emergence at the United Nations in 1948 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Revitalizing a broad and inclusive notion of dignity is critical for building a better future that can draw on religion and social solidarity. Such a concept of dignity does not require individuals to compromise their own beliefs and convictions, but it does involve paying attention to the reality that the broad spectrum of religions and worldviews are compatible with an inclusive notion of dignity. So let me turn now to the dynamic role of dignity in reinforcing social stability. At first glance, one might assume that dignity in the foregoing analysis is merely providing a kind of minimalist homogeneity, a convenient conceptual common denominator that provides a kind of overlapping consensus that can serve as the foundation for modern pluralistic societies. Moreover, there are fears that its strength as a potential unifier rapidly unravels as rival camps in modern culture wars attempt to capture the concept and utilize it for their own polarizing ends. 
Our work with many of you in support of the Punta del Este Declaration on Human Dignity for Everyone Everywhere suggests that more is at stake with the rich and generative concept of dignity. Dignity is, of course, an idea that has its roots in a variety of traditions, from antiquity, from theology, from enlightenment philosophy, and more. It is an idea that serves as a foundation for, an objective of, and a criterion of human rights thinking more general. In this sense, it is an axiomatic starting point that can be found in admittedly, admittedly slightly different forms in different traditions, and as such can serve as a shared starting point for moral reasoning. But the ideal of dignity serves is more than a static starting point for moral deductions. It, is a kind of, it has a kind of generative power that has the potential to expand vision and raise science. It has an inherent reciprocity that encourages those on one side of a moral argument to take the dignity of others into account. Moreover, it is a discursive concept with an upward trajectory. It typically serves as a basis for generating agreement and building common understanding and building such consensus on a higher plane that might have been reached without the appeal to dignity. Where conflicts arise, it can point to grounds for reconciliation. It serves as a reminder to eliminate the most egregious violation of human rights, to prioritize making progress, making progress in areas that are most feasible, where optimal respect for the rights of all can be achieved. What the Punta del Este Declaration helps emphasize is that the concept of dignity, the critical starting point for discussions of human rights and social justice, is not merely a static minimum condition for peace, it not only allows static harmony among different views, but also contributes to a dynamic reinforcement of the core pluralistic stability. In part, it has this effect because protecting dignity has as a social byproduct, a kind of gratitude for the society that protects it. This gratitude translates into loyalty to those protecting dignity and respect for the dignity of others. This positive dynamic can be further enhanced as one learns more about the beliefs and values of others. This deepening understanding of others' beliefs, particularly where those beliefs include a commitment to respect of others, results not only in initial stability, but in an ongoing dynamic that helps sustain and expand peace and stability over time. This is the deep inner force, the strong protection and freedom of religion and belief, and stabilizing public order. Note that this is a vital contributor to the United Nations 16th Sustainable Development Goal, namely the promotion of peace, justice, and strong institutions. Dignity and freedom of religion or belief provide key structural foundations that are absolutely vital if peace, justice, and strong institutions are to be achieved. In the G20 interfaith setting, we have included freedom of religion or belief as one of the key aspects of advancing sustainable development goal 16. Let me now say a word about dignity and depolarization. The difficulty of the foregoing picture is that it can be overshadowed by the paradox, the paradox at the center of conceptions of dignity and practical implementation of ideals of freedom of religion or belief that I referred to at the outset. The challenge is that the deep stabilizing and centripetal forces elicited by dignity and form can all too easily be overwhelmed by centrifugal forces of polarization emanating from deep differences. Such tendencies are all too often exacerbated in our soundbite culture by media that highlights and compounds polarization and media cultures that split us into rival tribes. Even in our polarized and polarizing times, however, dignity and its key legal shield, the right to freedom of religion or belief, can be helpful. Considering, consider the following partial list of ways that respect for dignity and form can contribute to building and strengthening a stable and just peace. Taking religious freedom seriously can help stabilize constitutional moments. Constitutions are not drafted behind Rawls and Bales of ignorance. They are formed by people exerting courage at moments of political tension. In such pre-constitutional moments, it is natural for members of society to be organized in competing and anxious groups, including religious groups. Constitutional norms which threaten such groups are unlikely to be stable. 
candid recognition of legitimate religious freedom concerns can diffuse suspicions that can otherwise poison the constitution-making atmosphere. Leaving the drama of constitutional moments aside, it's important to remember some of the practical ways that religious actors can contribute to resolution of conflict. At such times, <clears throat> religious freedom secures the ability of religious leaders to assume peace-building roles as trusted conflict mediators. Religious freedom helps cultivate an array of socially productive virtues, such as tolerance, religious reflective thinking, generosity, altruism, law-abidingness, honesty, helpfulness to others, and social trust. Religious institutions, if duly protected, can be helpful in opening channels of dialogue and negotiation. They can help in practical ways by making key mediating personnel available to peace processes. Religious freedom can also contribute to strengthening the material foundations needed for peace. If religious institutions and beliefs are protected in their core dignity, they need to devote less energy to self-protection and, and the peace dividend is experienced in their enhanced ability to contribute to social and material production. It's important to note that protecting dignity in general and protecting freedom of religion or belief in particular create important filtering mechanisms in society which help optimize the social goods generated by religion while imposing restrictions on religious evils. In that regard, it is helpful to think of religious freedom norms as finely honed tools that if exercised properly can restrict the dark side of religion by protecting core values of pluralism, freedom, dignity, and the countless other social goods with which religious freedom is empirically correlated. In conclusion, if my argument is correct, protection of dignity and the closely related freedom of religion or belief constitutes the deep architecture that helps find religion, social solidarity, and peace in the improved future we hope to see. I am conscious that in making this argument here, I am largely preaching to the choir. It is a great honor for me to join here with so many of you who have devoted your lives in effective ways to advancing these ideals. In making these arguments, however, I hope that I may be helpful or maybe helping others to think more about the critical role that dignity and freedom of religion or belief, these often neglected grandparents of all our freedom, the role they play in building a just society. I also hope that we can be better at helping others to understand how our best visions of social justice cannot be achieved without the enduring foundation of human dignity and freedom of religion and belief. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next. Mm -hmm. Next is a panel on interreligious solidarity, and the moderator is Professor uh, Ishalom, who will replace me. Good afternoon. Um, we've heard uh, a lot of uh, very interesting and constructive ideas uh, this morning and last night. Um, and uh, we would like now to uh, uh, have a discussion uh, with the three distinguished uh, panelists. I will uh, introduce them in a minute, but uh, I would like to open with the clarification of the context of our uh, uh, common activity. Um, I'm uh, the president of Beit Morasha of Jerusalem, and as an institution, uh, we have established about four years ago in cooperation with the Ministry of Interior, the Israeli government, a forum of uh, religious leaders uh, in mixed cities in Israel, uh, which aim to uh, 
not just to have an interface dialogue, which um, uh, takes place all over, but to uh, uh, develop a kind of a task force which will intervene in order to avoid conflicts on ethnical or religious uh, background in mixed cities in Israel. Uh, and I would like to show you a very short film of one minute and a half, uh, uh, a film which we uh, produced as a campaign in the events of last May uh, uh, in Israel, in the mixed cities of Israel. And uh, please. أنا الشيخ جمال العمرة إمام مسجد النور في رهط. شلون ودد إنساني مكيلا يستسفين بمعلو. سي سامويل فانوس من الرملة. أني يونس عماشا من فار عصفية إيش ده الشيخ أبو رمزي إمام مسجد عمد جروش برملة. Thank <laughs> العنف ليس في ديانة الدين الإسلامي الحنيف دين ضد العنف بل هو دين إسلام ومحبة بين الناس الموت في الوقفة الشبيه ليس في مبدئنا اللوبة الشبيه العنف ليس في ديانة أوكي Thank you for your patience. Uh, but this is uh, just a very uh, um, little example of the activities of this forum. Uh, we would like to focus now on um, the more uh, practical uh, uh, dimension. Uh, but first, uh, I would like to ask, uh, I, I will introduce my uh, fellows here. Uh, first, uh, Rabbi Yaakov Nagen, who is uh, the chairman of the director of uh, interfaith uh, uh, institution uh, in Otora Stone uh, institution in Efrat. Uh, he is a member of our forum and very active in many interfaith activities, uh, a, a real uh, leader in uh, uh, reaching peace amongst different groups. Uh, he is a senior rabbi in uh, the yeshiva of Otniel uh, and a very uh, good partner in our activities. Um, my friend, uh, Father uh, Fanos. Samuel. Samuel Fanos. Samuel. Um, <laughs> Samuel. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Shmuel is better. <laughs> uh, since our age, we are uh, uh, retired uh, people, although we are very active. So he has such a list of uh, positions uh, before he was retired. Uh, but he, he really served as the director and rector of uh, various churches uh, in uh, Israel, many cities Palestine. in Israel, Ramle and Ramallah, uh, Nazareth, and really all over the country. And he is a very uh, distinguished uh, uh, member in our forum. And of course, uh, our dear friend, uh, Sheikh Rasan Manasra, uh, who is uh, a Sufi. Uh, leader, uh, the head of the uh, uh, International uh, Abrahamic Reunion uh, uh, Organization. Uh, he is right now sitting in the States, but he runs all the programs in Israel and internationally. Uh, 
he is also the son of Sheikh uh, uh, Abdel Manasra, who is the leader of the Sufi movement, uh, not just in Israel, but uh, beyond our borders in the Middle East at large. So uh, this is a very uh, uh, distinguished uh, member in our forum, and we are very uh, happy to have these friends here with us today. I would like to uh, raise some questions, uh, but um, I will start first with one, uh, one significant uh, uh, question regarding the background of which uh, uh, we are, uh, um, we are uh, experiencing now. Uh, we are living in a changing world, very rapid uh, uh, changes and transformations uh, in all aspects of our lives, technologically, culturally, uh, politically, uh, there is uh, a rising of uh, religious extremism all over on the one hand, and there are some uh, expressions of uh, moderation and, 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 uh, and intentions of, uh, of peacemaking uh, at the same time in other places. Uh, there is uh, um, a crisis in, in religious authorities. Uh, religious authorities are questioning, questioned on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, the young generation uh, takes uh, the, the leadership uh, towards uh, problematic directions. Um, I would like to ask um, all our panelists, uh, what are, if you can map the major challenges in light of these, uh, uh, of these events, uh, the major challenges for religious leaders uh, these days. So since uh, we are in a severe uh, delay and, and Rabbi Nagen has to leave a little bit earlier, I would like to open with you. You know, Charles, first of all, welcome to Israel, all those who come from abroad. And it's also a pleasure to see friends of mine together again. The part of the challenge, um, Charles Dickens begins A Tale of Two Cities with, with was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I think modern technology and globalization could bring us both of these aspects of reality. First, I think technology perhaps solves an ancient riddle for readers of the Bible. In the biblical vision of the future, the Jewish people return from all around the world to the land of Israel. But at the same time of this movement from, um, from everywhere to one place, there's, a talk, there's there are visions of a role of being connected, being part of the largest door of, of humanity. And these things could, could be contradict each other. In fact, um, the German philosopher Hermann Cohen opposed Zionism because he felt this would undercut a role and connection of the Jewish people to humanity. I think modern technology um, allows, and the very fact that visitors from abroad allows a connection between humanity um, because of this technology, leaving us each in our place. But the challenge is have this connection to be a blessing and not the opposite. Um, and um, and I, I feel that often, even if even personal religious identities, to, to, I certainly know among Jews, but certainly I'm sure it's about other religions also, the feeling is global society is primarily secular. My deep religious identity is something perhaps for my home environment. When I connect to globalism, it'll often be to something um, that I have to give up on my personal identity. And I feel part of the challenge is not to abandon that global connection, but to link to one another um, through through the new technologies, the new possibilities to embrace them and make them for the better. There's so many other aspects, but maybe we'll do a circle and then I'll be happy to continue afterwards. Yeah. 
according to historical, chronological. Yeah, it's April with the Christmas, but yeah, it's with Rasta. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for calling us for this uh, panel, and I'm delighted to be with you uh, this evening. Um, uh, this is a big, big question that you can go on also like uh, this conference. But in short, you know, I have to come back. Actually, I'm Anglican and I'm uh, Arab Christian and Israeli, also in identity. And in all of these, I live as a minority, you know. So as Christian, you are in minority. This is one challenge uh, that you have to reach out others. Uh, and I never quit to reach out, uh, to reach out personally. Uh, this is my person that uh, this is a need of me growing, growing up in Israel uh, in the Jewish schools that will tell you, you are this and this and this, you are different, different bird. Uh, but then you understand that this is the children and they also are coming from different schools. And uh, this is the beginning. Um, and, and then I, I start to be uh, a facilitator between them too at one point, you know, because they are Jews from different countries and they have a lot of stereotypes uh, against each other and a lot of stereotypes. Uh, some professor came uh, to Neve Shalom. I was taking a course there uh, for a facilitator between Jews and Arabs in Neve Shalom in the 80, beginning of the uh, 81. And, uh, you know, whatever you do abroad in America, whatever you have, uh, uh, whatever the situation is extreme and uh, uh, from both sides, the uh, left and, but he said, you are full of it. Uh, really, uh, people don't know that they are full of it in this country. Uh, media occupied the full mind of you. This is a really challenge for uh, people who want to do peace <laughs> and cursing them. Whatever you say, even if you if you say something, nothing to do with the, uh, with the, you know, religion or politics, uh, just because you are related to some uh, group, immediately uh, social media, they are cursing you. So I think one challenge is to reduce that satanic, uh, satanic uh, responses to people in, in social media. And it's costly for the, uh, you know, uh, costly for those who do the uh, for software or whatever you call it, computers. This is very costly. I think they should do that. And that will draw some of the extremism in this world. Um, I grew up uh, in a evangelical, uh, my father was a preacher, evangelical preacher. And this is another challenge because uh, usually evangelicals uh, in the American context uh, belong more to the hard line. Uh, uh, not, not like today, I mean, you know, the QA none of uh, uh, attacking the capital and so on that people can uh, take uh, example of it. This is a really big problem. So we don't have to blame one religion of extremism. We have to start to blame our extremism as a person and to reduce it while uh, doing, uh, doing uh, a connection with others who live with you. And this is a big challenge and it's additional to your work as a pastor in your congregation. Uh, so uh, you face, you know, the, the, the Christianity uh, was a Separate, it was without politi politic politics in the first centuries, and they were persecuted, and they were completely pacifists. Despite that, they grow, and the Roman Empire became Christian, and then uh, power and money, uh, you know, corrupts, and then they start to um, uh, to oppress others and uh, kfia, kfia, uh, coercion, the region coercion, and so on. Um, and, lay, and then liberalism in uh, John Locke, uh, the professor mentioned John Locke, he is that start, start with the liberalism um, that connect, uh, disconnected between church and state, but the thing that church should have established and say their word 
and state their uh, words, but they don't have law enforcement against extremism. You can't, uh, the, the, the church cannot have enforcement, law enforcement against people who do wrong. So this is a challenge that we should be a witnesses in that situation of love, peace, and reaching out and going to the biblical resources that have authority, which in social media and, uh, and the technology reduce some of it because people don't have time to read the Bible and uh, they are shallow on it and then they can be washed brain by other cults and, uh, and this is uh, very dangerous to take them out of it. it it's a painful. So I can go on and on, but I, we don't have much time. Yeah, really. we'll, we'll return. <laughs> yeah, we'll return. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, welcome to Israel, all of you here. And I'm so happy to be uh, with you. And uh, thanks, Benny, to invite me to be part of my brothers and friends and colleagues uh, in, in th this path. It's, it's a great question, really. If we need to analyze this question, we need to go back to, to the reality of the uh, uh, religion uh, and the reality of the human being who who we are, what, what the meaning of religion, and what is the borders of that religion that it can be in, in clash with the, with the, with the uh, uh, modernity or, or with the um, uh, uh, technology. I think it's kind of new terminology of the 20th century or 19th century, 20th century to put some uh, 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 barriers in the way of the uh, development of yourself as a human being because I cannot be better if I'm a Muslim or I cannot be better if I'm a Jew I cannot be better if I'm a Christian I can be better if only if I'm uh, a, the, the, the person that uh, I'm following the prophecy of love as Ibn Arabi in the 13th century he is a, a great Sufi he say in, uh, in in the beginning they ask him what what is your religion and you look at the people and you say my religion is the love yeah. the meaning of my religion is the love and because because I want to tell you something we uh, uh, all of us we try to uh, uh, come to say to rebel that inner meaning of our religions and to say that our religion cannot move toward the technology <coughs> because if we are moving to the technology will emerge from that path between the technology and the religion and the path that the ways of our thinkings will 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 emerge the uh, 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 criminalism or, or or kind of terrorism I think also we need to, I will not talk a lot because I need to give to uh, uh, my brother, uh, Rabbi uh, Nagin, uh, but, but, but uh, we, we blame the other. The, the most important thing before you will begin to blame the other, we need to prepare ourselves for to go out to uh, mm -hmm. uh, create or to, to, to uh, uh, repair the path between and between you. I First of all, I need to clean my self first of all i i i, I can't under I, I, as that the same logical uh, question between human being and god yeah when, when you speak about god you speak from here to god you cannot speak from there to to, to yourselves or, or to ourselves we, we we cannot understand what is the reality of god there you know but it's how it's how can i imagine that uh, uh, thing to, or, or the, 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 the way of thinking to say something about God, then I think I, I, I cannot find any, any clash, but I can find the misunderstanding of the nuances of our religions for to uh, handle with the technology and with the other. Um, as, a, as a Jew, uh, I uh, must admit that um, I uh, distinguish uh, elements of extremism and fundamentalism uh, in Judaism, in my own religion. Uh, at the same time, I, uh, I argue that uh, elements of uh, fundamentalism and extremism are rooted in all 
religions uh, in all our classical religious texts. And um, many of the uh, uh, radical movements, uh, fundamentalistic movements uh, these days uh, are inspired by uh, classical religious sources and, and, and religious authorities. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, to what extent uh, do you uh, see uh, the tool of, uh, I would say, a creative interpretation on the classical uh, religious texts as a mean to advance uh, an approach of, of uh, an inclusive uh, religious approach, a, a religious approach which will, uh, uh, will construct uh, an alternative uh, theological paradigm which will uh, embrace uh, other religions, other human beings who don't belong to my uh, to my group. Uh, so, who wants? Let's start okay. with, with you. <laughs> Thank now. you. First of all, it's 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 a great to say that uh, 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 um, I, I heard something once from. Uh, Rabbi Nagin, if, if it's okay to, to give you to talk after that, I'll talk after you. Because I remember you saying where, where we were in Salt Lake City, yes. and, and you say very great things about this, uh, uh, about that. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Well, okay, so I'll start, and you'll have to remind me afterwards. <laughs> well, we, um, yeah, yeah, we all know the words of William Blake. We both read Bible day and night. You read black, and I read white. But I'd like to disagree with the hidden assumption of, of your question, which I think is part of the problem. When we talk about a need, there are perhaps three possibilities about how we could understand what is truly the simple meaning of the sacred texts, whether the, the, um, the Jewish Bible, the New Testament, or the Quran. One approach, as William Blake implies, that it's something perhaps subjective, that Everybody finds what they want over there, so it could be this way or it could be that way. Another approach, and I feel this a little bit, the assumption of the question, assumes that the simple meeting is, is very problematic in terms of openness and connection, and therefore there's a need for, can we give a creative reinterpretation, which would take us to a different, different meaning of the simple text, but to meet the needs of our times, can we creatively reinterpret? Um, I, I feel after an, um, many years on this subject, and this is part of the role of, of my, my Beit Midrash, the study center, is to is argue what I believe to be the truth, that true, there are elements going both ways, but ultimately, in terms of the authentic original message will be that one of connection in both the Bible, the New Testament, and the Quran. Just to bring one example, um, according to, and not even from my tradition, um, the Quran is not organized chronologically. It goes from larger to smaller. But according to tradition, the fifth surah of the Quran, al maida the table, is con often considered to be the latest um, of the surah of the Quran. And in the heart of it, there's a statement saying that if, if Allah wanted, he could have given one religion to all. But he chose to give the Torah to the Jews, and this is light and guidance, the Evangel, Evangel to the Christians, and the book to the, referring to the Quran, to the Muslims, and therefore all should do based on what they have received, and those who believe in God, the last day, and, um, and do good, have a place in heaven. Now, this, there, I believe it's the radical reinterpreters are not the people, I don't feel we need creative interpretation to say that it says what it really says. The creative interpretation are those who say that this was abrogated, even though this is the last surah of the Quran. The, those that say that Adam, and also have to believe in Muhammad the prophet, um, et cetera, et cetera, this is, rad this is the creative reinterpretation. So I feel that, and I could go through, there's not, not time to all the traditions, yes, they're challenging passages in all, 
But the heart, the heart of each tradition, it is we don't need the creative reinterpretation. We have to free ourselves from creative interpretation guided by politics and human failings and go back to the authentic voice of the Holy Scripts. I, I want to say something. I, I heard what I want to hear from you because it was, it for me, was in a, a like new new method, new new way, new path. It's about five years ago. I remember that. But I, 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 ah, I it's not working. It's well. not working. Oh, it's not working wonderfully fine. Uh, maybe I, I want to say something that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, about the two, we have a very a, a strong and very uh, a moderate tool to use all of, the, all of our time since the beginning of the world until today is to renew the uh, a, a, a sacred text interpretation, commentary. I want to say something like sometimes if you look at our uh, 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 sacred text, the Quran. I want to say that the, the, the people think that we have only one interpretation. It's not true. We have thousands upon thousands of interpretations. We have the Shia interpretation. We have the Sunni inter interpretation. We have the Sufi interpretation. We have the uh, Salafi interpretation. But when you'll speak about Islam as a Muslim, I speak about myself. I need to, 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 to uh, look at myself in real and say why I accept all of these different interpretations and I will not accept the interpretation of the Jews or of the Christians, I think they believe in their sacred texts as a new interpretation. I need to respect their